Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. External storage on iPads can be super helpful at times, whether you're using it to store files or work between devices or just to expand your general storage if you've got a device that doesn't have a lot to begin with. Going out and buying a drive is simple enough, but with iPads, things can get more complicated. Not only do you have to consider standard things that you would with a regular computer or laptop like drive capacity and transfer speed, there's some problems unique to iPad. You've only got one port along the bottom which will run at a different speed depending on which model you have. Uh, having a single port also plays into battery life and on top of that, the way that iPads read and write data with external drives can be wildly different than you'd expect. Today, I wanna dive into this topic and the details surrounding transfer speeds, battery life, what to look out for with different storage types and how you can get the most out of them. So with that said, let's get into it. All right, so first things first, I'm gonna be using four external storage drives to demonstrate and go over a lot of this material as it relates to iPads in particular. There's the cheapest out of the bunch, this Orico UFSD thumb drive. We'll get into the SanDisk Extreme Portable SSD, Samsung T7 Shield, and finally this Acasis USB 4 enclosure with a Western Digital SN770 installed in it. All of these drives have strengths and weaknesses, which we'll touch on in a bit, but before we do that, let's back up a second and just ask, why would you buy one of these products for your iPad? Well, it probably wouldn't have made sense in the past, but since iPad OS 13, iPads have slowly started to add more features that allow you to use your iPad more like a computer or a laptop. And with advancements in Apple Silicon, they now have the power to fully support some folks switching from a MacBook or a laptop to an iPad, just scrapping their laptop altogether. Things like external monitor support, creative and video editing apps, improved file navigation, all these things have popped up within the last few years. And the big one that's added is native support for external drives like the ones that I have here. Because you're able to treat the iPad as more of a workstation for lack of a better term, it makes sense that you'd want to be able to hook up an external drive to do things like store media, backups, working files, and other large files without using up all the space on your iPad, which in many cases isn't usually a lot. All the newest additions in the iPad lineup have moved to USB-C ports, so they all look the same in that regard but they have drastically different speeds between each model, some of which end up being a bottleneck when using an external storage drive. The iPad 10 tops out at 480 megabits or 60 megabytes per second, which can be painfully slow depending on what you're trying to do, and it won't use any of these drives to their full potential. The M1 iPad Airport, Airport, ha. That on the other hand runs at 10 gigabits or 1250 megabytes per second and can transfer large files relatively quickly and is overall pretty snappy. Finally, the M2 iPad Pro can run at USB 4 or Thunderbolt speeds capable of 40 gigabits or five gigabytes per second and rivals the internal SSD drive speeds of some pretty powerful machines. There's something that might be useful if you have a workflow with super demanding file transfer requirements like video editing, or you just want those insanely fast transfer speeds. Knowing that port specification, whether you have one of these models or something else, will give you a pretty solid foundation for understanding how fast a flash drive or an SSD can potentially run on your iPad. Usually if you take a look at a product page for these external drives, they're pretty upfront in telling you what the drive transfer speed is and if that aligns with the speed on your port. You can also take a look at the USB version supported if you want as well, but unless you have a solid understanding of how that all works, it can be kind of confusing. USB versioning is an absolute mess, and sometimes if you're just looking at the version, it can be kind of misleading. You can see on this drive here, it says USB 3.2 Gen 1, which used to be USB 3.1 Gen 1, which used to be USB 3.0. You can start to see where that confusion comes in. That protocol is supposed to be good for up to five gigabits per second, but if you look on the packaging, it says it runs up to 100 megabytes, which is roughly 800 megabits, and that is about one fifth of that speed. So for me, I usually just go by the listed transfer speed. Just keep in mind that with any drive, these are advertised speeds or theoretical max values, and chances are you're never gonna reach those speeds, especially on iPads. Let me show you what I mean with the drives that we have here today. These are all the real world speeds of these drives exclusively on the iPad. Most of these tests I've done on the M1 iPad Air where the M2 iPad Pro was used solely to test out the USB 4 speeds on the Acasis enclosure. You'll notice that everything is well below the advertised speed, which is to be expected. 
the Acasis with the SN770 in it is still blazingly fast. The SanDisk and Samsung speeds are still very quick and the flash drive lags behind quite a bit. If these numbers don't mean anything to you, I did some real world file transfers, reading and writing a 10 gigabyte file on each of these drives, which just for context would be about two hours of 4K video on a streaming platform like Netflix or Disney Plus. The USB 4 drive made the round trip in just under eight seconds where the SanDisk and Samsung drives are fairly similar to each other coming in at 34 and 45 seconds. The Oracle thumb drive dragged on to a minute and 37 seconds in one format and over two minutes in another. That formatting is really important to note and we'll come back to that in just a minute, but as you can tell, outside of the flash drive, things are pretty fast. If you've got an iPad Air or a Pro and you're using it more like a laptop or even offload some larger files or backups, the speeds that these middle of the pack SanDisk Extreme and Samsung T7 drives deliver are gonna be more than fast enough in most instances. If you do have the iPad Pro and you want those extremely fast speeds for almost instantaneous file transfers, or if you're doing a lot of 4K video editing or something super demanding working off external storage, then maybe it makes sense to pick up a drive with USB 4 or Thunderbolt speeds. Right now, you might be wondering what on earth a little flash drive like this could possibly be good for, given how much slower they are, so let's explore that a little. Outside of the fact that these are much cheaper, there's a couple of reasons as to why you might consider a thumb drive like this Oracle UFSD over these SSDs. If your usage is just really basic, stuff like throwing files or photos onto a drive for safekeeping, or anything where you don't care about speed, these become a lot more attractive. Also, if you've got an iPad that isn't an Air or Pro model and you're not gonna be able to take advantage of the speed of those other drives, again, these are a lot more appealing. Now, one thing that you're probably gonna bump up against with flash drives, which tons and tons of people have had issues with regardless of which iPad you own, is that they have notoriously slower than expected speeds. As I mentioned earlier, iPads do behave differently when it comes to reading and writing to devices, and they seem to have issues specific to just flash drives and XFAT formats. When you buy any of these drives that I've mentioned outside of the Western digital drive that you have to put in the enclosure yourself, they're almost always formatted to XFAT, and without getting into the details, all you really need to know is this is a format that is compatible on both Windows and Mac, which is likely why you see this so often. On this Oracle, in the majority of thumb drives out there, you'll notice that you see brutal speeds compared to testing them on a Mac or a PC, but there is something that you can do to fix this, at least on this specific drive. If I go to my Mac and plug this into my machine and open Disk Utility, I can click on the thumb drive and hit Erase, which will erase everything on this drive and reformat it. In this pop-up window, I can change the type to APFS with a GUID partition, hit erase, and everything should take a few seconds to complete. The catch to all of this is that APFS is exclusively designed for Apple devices, so you will lose the ability to use this drive on Windows, but the advantage is APFS formats are generally a little bit quicker, and they're less prone to corruption, so it's a much more ideal format if you're just in the Apple ecosystem. Once you do that, you can see that read speeds are almost four times faster, still not anywhere near these other drives, which by the way, don't seem to have their speed affected in either of these formats, but with APFS on this flash drive and likely others as well, you'll see a considerable difference that makes them much more usable. And for iPads specifically, these have one huge advantage over everything else. Because we only have a single port available, one thing that we need to take note of is battery life. I know that you can use a powered USB hub so that you don't have to worry about battery life, but that's a topic for another video. And for this video, we're just going to assume that we're on battery power. Now, iPads these days have generally great battery life on their own, but when you plug drives like these in, that can change pretty quickly. I wanted to test out the effect that these drives have on battery life, so I played a 45 minute 10 bit H265 video on repeat on the iPad Air M1 with the brightness turned up all the way, first without connecting anything to determine a solid baseline. And then I went through each of these external drives, running the battery down from 100% to zero. The Oracle flash drive is very similar to the iPad without anything connected, running for 5.28 hours compared to 5.56 on the standalone iPad. From there, it drops considerably with the SanDisk Extreme and Samsung T7 Shield hovering around the same at 3.15 and 3.24 hours, where the Acasis enclosure comes in at a miserable 2.5 hours. 
destroying the battery life. Just know that this was under constant stress with the hooked up drives running the entire time. So this is a pretty extreme situation with a lot of constant data transfer that likely won't resemble real world use, but it does showcase how efficient each of these drives are. You might be curious as to why I'd include both the T7 Shield and the SanDisk Extreme drives in this video, given that up to this point, they are relatively the same specs wise, but this is intentional for a couple of reasons that sit outside of these tests. When you're using an iPad, for a lot of people, you're gonna be using it in different places and carting it around with you and portability and durability become more of a factor. And that's where these two have a couple of differences. Both the SanDisk and Samsung drives are relatively the same size, but the Samsung drive has a three meter drop protection where the SanDisk Extreme has two. And the T7 Shield has an IP65 rating, meaning it is completely dustproof and can handle things like water splashes and low pressure spray. The SanDisk drive and most portable drives like this don't carry the same IP rating, so they're a little less durable in that regard. I also wanted to call out one thing with the SanDisk portable drives if you're considering two terabyte or larger capacities. These recently had a bad production run where some folks have seen issues with these drives. I'm sure it'll get resolved, but the Samsung drives seem to be a little bit more reliable in that regard, whether you get the T7 Shield or the regular T7 or T5. Looking at the other drives, the thumb drive is obviously the most portable of the bunch, but is a little more delicate. And this external enclosure isn't great for carting around with you if you do have exposure to dust or or rain. I'm not sure if it has a drop rating either, and it is a little bit bigger as well, but it's still relatively small. If you've been around the channel for a while, you probably know that I've been using this Acasis enclosure with the SN770 at my desk to edit all my videos, and it's held up really well, and honestly, all of these devices have worked great for me. I'll link them all in the description below, along with a few other options as well, if you aren't into these lesser known brands like Acasis or Oroco. When it comes down to it, if you want a really solid drive with decent speeds that's reliable and portable, you can't go wrong with either of these SanDisk or Samsung drives, or if you just need something super cheap and small that isn't going to affect your battery life much, maybe a flash drive makes sense. If you're looking for the best of the best, USB 4 or Thunderbolt is the way to go. There are options out there that are self-contained like the SanDisk Pro G40 SSD, which you can sometimes find on sale for $250 or so. But this Acasis enclosure with a good NVMe drive is usually the best option when it comes to price versus performance. But I do know a lot of folks don't want to fiddle around with this kind of thing either and just want something that they can plug in and go. I know I only have a few drives here and there are tons more out there. So I'd love to hear what everyone else is using for their iPad if you're using external storage. Do you have something that works well for you and what are you using it for? Let me know in the comments down below along with any questions that you might have. I kind of threw a lot of info out here about Hopefully you found this useful. If you did, feel free to hit that like button if you wanna see more tech related content or if you wanna get out of my dreams and into my car, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.